Hello to our viewers out there. My name is Sharon Sherry and I'm your ARRA host for our chat with the talented and multi-published Sarah Mabry who thinks she has the best job in the world, writing. Welcome Sarah and thank you for making time to chat with us today. Now before I get into asking Sarah questions about her latest releases, let me tell you a little bit about her. Sarah is the award-winning, best-selling author of more than 30 books. She lives by the Bay in Melbourne with her husband and a small furry cavoodle called Matt. When she isn't writing romance, Sarah writes scripts for Neighbours, that long, long running show, as well as working on other film and TV projects. She loves to cook and to go shoe shopping, knows she should spend more time in the garden, and considers curling up with a good book to be the height of luxury. Sarah and her husband are almost finished renovating their home, and she spends a bit of that time she should be gardening thinking about how it will all look. Sarah, welcome and thank you for taking the time to meet with us tonight. Um, I just have to tell you before we start, one of my personal favourites of your books is her best work, uh, sorry, her best worst mistake. So for those of you who haven't discovered Sarah's writing, many of the books on her backlist are available as e-books, so you have a chance to catch up on a good sized backlist, which is always a joy. So. Sarah, that's quite a big backlog. How long have you been writing? How, sorry, when were you first published, I guess, is the question. I was first published in 2004. Um, yes, so that's eight years ago, I guess now, isn't it? Nearly, nearly nine. And, um, yes, it's, it's, I, sometimes even I have a look at that page on my website and wonder how all of those book covers got there. It's been a, a wild and crazy ride, but it's been fantastic as well. Right, that's a lot of books published in just a few years. You must write quite quickly. Um, well, I think it's all relative, isn't it? I do write full time, so I I treat it like a full time job. I get up in the morning, I sit down at the computer, and I have a, a set amount of words that I like to write every day. Um, generally, if I'm um, not on deadline, it's sort of about three thousand words. And um, sometimes those words come really easily and you're finished by midday and you can go shoe shopping. And sometimes those words do not come at all and you have, you know, it's like you're chiselling them out of rock. And uh, when I'm on deadline, you know, sometimes you have to write more than that and um, work into the night and work weekends and all that sort of stuff. But it's a job and I treat it like a job and it's got to, you've got to have the discipline to get those words down. And uh if you add all those little increments of 3,000 words a day up, you can sort of understand how you, you get those books done in that period. Yeah, that's actually a really good goal for all of those uh, aspiring writers out there. Set yourself a word goal and stick to it and uh, the words can mount up quite quickly. Well, Stephen King's is 2,000 a day, um, which I think is really lovely actually. <laughs> um, I, I'd, I'd love to do 2,000 words a day. but. Um, I sort of make myself do that extra thousand and it gives me time to do other projects around the side like my script writing and things like that. Right. Now Sarah's most recent release under the New Look Essence line is The Other Side of Us. It's a book where traditional storylines, that of a grumpy reclusive hero and a woman left alone after a broken marriage are magically reversed. And for the animal lovers out there, there's a bit of doggy love to bring them together, courtesy of Max's entry into Sarah's life about 14 months ago. Most of us love it when animals or babies are part of the story. Sarah will also chat about Suddenly You, the book you released uh, last November, which is Pippa and Harry's story, and there's a little bit of history to that as well. First, though, um, tell us about your early reading habits and how you got into reading and wanting to write romance novels. Um... My, both my grandparents, so my mother's mother and my father's mother, were romance readers. And my my mother's mother had these old um, black, sorry, um, hardcover, black and someone, I can't remember what the brand was, romances with these beautiful pastel watercolour painted covers um, and with titles like The Gooseberry and things like The Perils of Pauline and things like that. Um, and my... Other, my father's mother had uh, sort of current day Mills and Boons with, um, and I guess it was probably the 70s, early 80s that she was getting those books. So the men all had sideburns and the ladies were on wearing mini skirts. And, and um, I probably shouldn't have been reading them, to be honest. <laughs> they were pretty raunchy. <laughs> but um, I loved them. I, I just 
sort of gobbled them up and then I discovered all those Sweet Valley High and Sweet Dreams romances and then a little bit later on I discovered Georgette Haya and um, yeah, so it's, it's just been a love affair with romance from beginning to end really. And for those who don't know Sarah, she did try her hand at some Regency romances way back when but and we might get into that later but they will never see the light of day. No, they will not. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, let's talk about your most recent release, The Other Side of Us. It was a great book. The prologue told us so much so quickly about Oliver and really set the scene. Did he write his own story or you had to work a bit to get him? He did write his own story to a certain extent because I'd done that sort of role reversal thing where I had him be the cuckolded, betrayed one and her be the curmudgeonly loner. Um, I was I was quite concerned as I was writing that he would come across as um, a bit soft or, um, or, you know, just foolish, I guess, because he's being cuckolded. It's funny how you have those little stereotypes in your mind that it's okay. Um, in a romance, it's reasonably common that a woman's being betrayed and that's okay. That doesn't make her less viable or less feminine or, you know, it's usually the ex-husband's fault that that's happened. But I was just really aware of not emasculating Oliver while also being true to his experience of, of being angry and betrayed and um, feeling foolish and all of those sort of things. Um, so I had him chop some wood, actually. <laughs> I decided I was going to have him out there doing chopping some wood and doing some things that show that even though he was sensitive and a bit damaged, he was... Also still a man. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, rescuing her when her house was about to get flooded was a, a pretty manly thing. What made you reverse your original idea for the character's stories? Because that's quite an interesting change of, of character positioning. Well, you mentioned um, Suddenly You before. Um, when I got to the end of Suddenly You and I was sort of writing the, the sort of final scenes of that, I don't know, I, so there's a time towards the end of the book where you start thinking about the next project. Um, writers always tell you that the next project is always much more interesting than the one that you're actually working on because, of course, you're not bored with it yet or you haven't been wrestling with it for days on end. But I... Um, I started thinking about that uh, the book and I just all of a sudden realised that I'd created two female characters with trust issues. Uh, P Pippa is uh, afraid of falling for a man who is like her, the man who got her pregnant accidentally and, um, in, in fact, is his best friend. And uh, Mackenzie has, you know, at that point had been in a relationship and her husband had been betraying her for almost the entirety of it. And I realised that I was going to get to the end of that book and I'd be writing the, the scenes of conflict and dark moments and that I would be sort of fishing in the same sort of ice hole, I guess. And, and I decided that I, I didn't want to back myself into that corner. So I sort of started thinking about ways of changing that up. And then I, my first thought was just what if I swapped those roles over and um, straight away my story brain just went, oh, that's great and had all these ideas and... And I got really excited about it, so that, that was terrific. So from the prologue, which sends Oliver on his way to the very isolated area our story takes place in, we switch to Mackenzie, and our first view of her, we're straight in and we're feeling her pain as she's rehabilitating from the accident. Where did all that come from? Did you have to do a bit of research around rehabilitation and getting to know all of the ins and outs of that? Well, I'm very fortunate in that my husband, who is also a writer, was also a physiotherapist in his former career. So I was able to talk to him about the sort of things that someone would be doing after having a major accident and the sort of uh, issues they'd have with range of movement, with the kind of injuries that I was thinking about for Mackenzie. I, I wanted her to be, obviously, to have long-term effects from it, but not to be so debilitated that you know, the steamy bits of the book, for example, would require massive manoeuvring and all that sort of stuff. So I was trying to be very practical about those things. I did a lot of research online as well, um, reading people's accounts of their experiences. And I have a neighbour who's a, a nurse. She also comes in handy. Good to have it on tap, I guess, makes it a bit easier. Now, Smitty and Strudel, the two doggies, in the, in the book are such adorable and naughty characters. 
Do you think you'd have written this story and had them feature so much in it before Max came into your life? Oh, no, not at all. Um, I we, we had a dog when I was a, a little girl, but he left my life pretty pretty early on when my parents got divorced. And I, I don't really remember what it was like having him around. I can remember we used to torture him by um, dressing her in scarves and beads and things like that, which, of course, she just loved not. But um, getting Max has just been a revelation, really. He's um, adorable and he's fantastic company and I cannot believe how much I love him and how much personality he has and what just fantastic companionship he, he provides, really. I totally get all of the cat and dog love out there in the world now. I really do. <laughs> and he keeps your company while you write, I think. Yes, he's um, his favourite position in all the world during the day is to um, leap up into my lap while I'm writing, which often means I have to sort of work around him and give myself arm strain, etc. But um, I'm such a complete pushover <laughs> that I sort of spend half the day kowtowing to his desire to be in my lap and then I sort of realise I haven't got my word count done and push him off and, and, um, and sort of buckle down. There were some very dark moments spread throughout the book for both characters, but you, you offset this so well with sweetly painful and at other times joyful realisation. How easily after 30 books do you hook into all those necessary emotions uh, with so many books under your belt? Is it easy? Is it still difficult? Um, no, not at all. I mean, I, I spent, I'm, I'm a plotter rather than, you know, I don't know if people know of those terms, plotter and pants are for romance writers. I, I really plan my stories out in advance. I spend a lot of time thinking about my characters before I start writing the book. Um, and so I, I really feel like I know them before I start writing, And even though, I mean, obviously you get to know them better as you're working through the first two or three chapters. Um, and sometimes you even throw those first two or three chapters out because they're, they're almost like a, a fact-finding mission to work out who these people are. Um, but once I'm in their skin, um, I do, I find it um, relatively easy. I think I'm a, um, an emotional storyteller. Um, that was the way I always worked when I was a storyliner in at Neighbours. My, my sort of big thing was always how would I feel if this happened to me? What would I do? What would I say? You know, and, um, and I, I pretty much do that when I'm writing a book as well. It's a little bit like being an actor in a way. You're sort of playing the parts as you're writing. And um, I know a few other writers do this as well, but if, if you're actually watching me type particularly dialogue scenes, I do kind of go like this and, oh, you know, one person's talking and then the other person's talking and you're really getting into it. Um, and, and it's, you know, they're emotional experiences writing those emotional scenes. You know, I, I cry with every book. Um, if I don't cry, I feel like there's something wrong and I, you know, I go back. <laughs> I make myself cry. I have to find a, a part of the book that will really get me going because for me, if I don't put the emotion in at my end, I don't feel like the reader's going to feel it at their end either. So for our viewers, if you've missed this recent release, I suggest you do your best to find it. Curl up on the lounge for a most enjoyable few hours. You won't regret it. Let's go back a few months, well, back to the release date of November last year anyway, to Suddenly You. You mentioned in the frontal piece that this was the second time you had written a sequel. What was so special about the characters when you met them the first time that you had to tell their story? Well, Harry first appears in All They Need um, and he's the brother of the heroine Mel and um, I didn't really think much of him, I guess, as I was, you know, I mean, obviously I, I like my secondary and third or whatever characters, the peripheral characters to feel real to me as well. So I sort of, I do know some things about them as I'm writing about them. I have very strong pictures of what they look like in their head, but there's a particular scene in... Um, Suddenly You, where Harry is helping his sister carry these big um, wooden sleepers for a garden bed from one um, the front yard to the backyard and they're, you know, teasing each other basically and giving each other a hard time. And he just was so vivid in my mind and I liked him so much and I started thinking um, about who he was and how fun it would be to have a hero who is essentially just a big boy who hasn't really grown up, uh, good at heart, um, 
all, all the right values, but he's still, even though he's 30-ish, stuck in that sort of 18 to 22 age bracket of, you know, late nights playing pool and getting drunk with your mates and partying hard and getting up surfing with a hangover and all that sort of stuff. And he, he needs to grow up essentially. And um, so he was, he, he did become quite vivid in that, in that book for me. And then obviously got excited about writing a sequel for him, giving him his comeuppance, if you will. <laughs> he is one of life's good guys, as you say, even if he doesn't realize it, I'd probably be happy to take him home to my mother in about 10 years. <laughs> um, I, I thought the character of Pippa was a great match for him. Watching him fall in love with Alice was very sweet. Was it fun to write that story? Oh, Pippa's just life? an absolute hooch. It really—it was one of those books that, um, you know, there wasn't any really, really dark, angsty conflict. I mean, there, there was still... Um, I still cried <laughs> when I was writing it, but it, I didn't feel like I was going into some of the really deep, dark places that I have with some of my other books. I've, you know, I've dealt with um, children who were the victims of um, violent abuse and uh, various other things like that. And um, these guys had sort of what I would consider sort of fairly normal level romantic conflict. And um, they had a lot of fun with each other. They had good banter and... Um, and there's a little bit of sort of slap, slapsticky humour in there as well. There's a there's a scene with some spec filler and um, a bathtub and various other things. And I had a lot of fun with that. Well, I had fun reading it. Let me tell you. Now you still write for TV, and I read that you uh, created co-created a teen drama series called Karaoke High, and it screened in New Zealand, Canada, France, and Australia. That must have been a pretty exciting thing to happen. It was amazing and um, I, in a way, wish I could go back and do it, uh, experience it again because I don't know that I actually appreciated at the time how unique it was. I mean, I, I appreciated it <laughs> but, you know, it's probably never going to happen to me in my lifetime and um, I wish that I had pushed a little bit harder to be more involved in the production because at, at that point we'd actually moved back home from... New Zealand to Australia and a lot of the production and things were going on, um, you know, where we were obviously a, an ocean away and um, I, I wish I'd sort of made a, a bigger effort to be a part of it all because it was fantastic and really exciting and I'm still very proud of it as a, as a show for tween ages, I guess it's where it's aimed at. Well, if uh, I don't know, I, I actually didn't see it go through. But if it ever comes back again, I'll have I'll I'll know I know the author now or the creator. <laughs> and they still do occasionally play it on ABC Three. I've seen it um, a couple of times last year, so it's, it just pops up every now and then. <laughs> are there any other sequels coming around in your head, or have you got you know you got some new stories happening? But are any of them sequels that we can expect to marry back to other books we've read? Not. Specifically, uh, the book I'm working on, sorry, the book that I've handed in and that will come out in September, Her Favourite Rival, Harlequin approached me uh, not so long ago actually and asked me if I would like to write a novella that would lead into or be run parallel to that story. So that's what I'm writing at the moment. Um, there's two sisters at the heart of that story and I, I told one of the sisters' story and um, so in the novella, which is just getting bigger by the day, um, I, I'm telling the other sister's story. I had sort of thought that I would turn that into a um, full-length super romance, but I'm, I'm actually quite happy with the place it's going to find us in, in the end. It's going to be a digital-only book is my understanding at this point, and I believe Harlequin are, are going to give it away for free at a certain point to entice people to read the other books. So I, I don't know whether um, Mills and Boone Australia will be following that strategy. I certainly will be talking to them about it and hoping that that will happen. Um, so I'm quite excited about that. Yeah, I would be too. When Harlequin comes knocking, not you, <laughs> not you sending the stuff to them, they're actually asking you to do it. That's a really nice position to be in. Now, I, I wonder whether or not you had any plans to move into the single title world and, and produce, you know, the big 80 to 100,000 word novels. Yes, look, I think most writers dream of, you know, coming out with their opus and all that sort of stuff. And I've had ideas on and off over the years for single title length 
contemporary romances. Um, you know, the super romances we're writing now are 85,000 words, so you're almost there anyway, really. And um, so I'm confident I can write that length and surprisingly I even sometimes run out of words with my 85,000 word count. So um, it would be lovely to not have that cap in a way. Um, I did have a crazy caffeine-induced couldn't sleep moment uh, a few months ago where I had all these ideas popping in my brain so I got up at 2.30 in the morning and sat at the computer and wrote out this massive storyline um, and I've started working on that in my um, spare time <laughs> and I've got a few thousand words of that and I'm just going to keep on chipping away at it. I don't know how big it's going to be in the end. It'll be two books. I suspect they're probably going to be reasonably chunky so we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Oh, well, we look forward to that. Now, how do you fit in writing for television, writing novels, renovating a house, mothering a cavoodle, being a wife and shopping for those shoes? You must be pretty organised. <laughs> uh, it's a nice idea. Um, I have deadlines and um, I, you know, there's, there's, you just can't let people down at the end of the day. So sometimes, um, you know, with my scripts, I'm, I'm on a regular rotation with them. So I, I know when they're coming and when I'll have meetings and when they're due. And I also have my deadlines for my books, months, weeks, actually years in advance, sometimes if you have a contract with X many, that enough books in it. So I know where all my, my marks are and I have to hit them. And um, because I've got my 3,000 a word, I suppose I am organised. Now I'm saying all that. I'm just <laughs> I'm sounding very organised. I? Um, but often my husband does come home and there's no food in the house and uh, there's always dog food but there's often no human food and um, I'm in my pyjamas still and there's just chaos everywhere. So I guess I kind of focus my organisation. <laughs> ah, well, you know, you can't be great at everything, tell him. <laughs> <laughs> now I thought I might finish for the last few minutes of our time together with a few questions to tease a bit more information out of you. If you could hold a dinner party with five other people at the table, who would they be and why? Whenever I sort of think about these questions, because this is one of those questions that, that, you know, often comes up at dinner parties or whatever, I always fall back on writers that I would love to pick their brains and see what they're like and all that sort of stuff. So I, I from a very, very young age, have always loved The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. So to have um, J.R. Tolkien at the dinner table would be amazing. Um, uh, Sherry S. Tepper is a sort of feminist fantasy fiction writer that I, his writing I find really interesting and challenging. Um, I'd love to see what she's like as well. Um, I greatly admire Lisa Kleypas, um, both her historicals and her contemporaries. I'd love to pick her brain. And um, I think Victoria Dahl would be an absolute hoot to have her on a dinner, pa uh, dinner party. And... Um, I would definitely ply her with cocktails and whatnot and uh, see what mischief I could get her to get up to. And lastly, which but this may be a bit boring, but I would love to have my husband Chris there because he's um, very clever and funny and a great conversationalist and it would be so good to have a bit of a gossip about everybody after they've gone home afterwards while we're washing the dishes and everything. I'd like to be at that dinner party, I think. Sounds like a great time. Now, do you have your own office or a special part of the house that's just yours for writing? Uh, we do. My husband and I share it together. Um, a long time ago when we first bought our own home, it had enough rooms in it for us to have studies each and I thought that was just the height of luxury. Um, but after years of working at home on my own 24-7 pretty much a lot of the time, I, um, I love sharing a space with someone else. I love... You know, when, when we're both working away and there's the clackety-clack of somebody else at their keyboard working away and we can ask each other questions and read bits out to each other. and I, I love that. I find that very comfortable and companionable. What's your favourite way to relax after a hard day working and writing? Reading. I'd love, I mean, really, my absolute ideal anything, <laughs> really, is to make myself cosy on the couch and um, have a great book 
from one of my favourite writers, someone reliable that I know is going to give me a good time. And, you know, maybe if there's some kind of edible food product involved with that as well. And Max napping on my feet, I'm a pretty happy lady. So how do you reward yourself for finishing a book and handing it in? Well, usually towards the end of the book writing process, there is a period where you realise that the deadline is approaching like a freight train and that you don't have enough time left to do stuff. So you start to give up on things like talking to friends and going out of the house and you know, sometimes dressing and things like that. So um, it's, it's like being let out of jail when I hand a book in. Uh, it's like... That's gone, fantastic. Um, there's a bunch of Melbourne writers who get together once a month if we can um, and we all go and have a, a big lunch together and share the sort of wins and losses that we've had in our careers in the you know intervening weeks um, and that's fantastic. So I always let myself go to one of those when I've finished a book. That's a treat and um, there may there may be a couple of shoe shops that I always drift out to after one of those lunches and many a pair of shoes have been purchased post a lunch um, at the end of a book. So <laughs> So what's your favourite brand of shoe? Um, there's an Italian company. Um, they do clothes as well um, and they, they said they sell their shoes under two different brands. One is Maloney and the other one is Ixos and they, they sort of make quite... Um, unusual, stylish rather than fashionable shoes, if that makes sense. And um, I love their kookiness. So I have a few pairs now and I would love to add to my collection. <laughs> if you could go back in time or forward, for that matter, what's the one area you'd like to visit and why? Regency England, uh, because I've read every Georgette Heyer book there is. I love Regency romances and continue to love Regency romances. Um, I'd just love to go back and see if it's like it is in the books. I suspect it wouldn't be and maybe it would ruin the fantasy for me, but I'm just so deeply curious about it all that I'd, I'd love to see it for myself. And my last question for you is who are some of your favourite authors? Oh, well, I've already mentioned Lisa Kleypas, um, her... Um, contemporary romance sort of trilogy of Sugar Daddy, Blue-Eyed Devil and Smooth Talking Stranger are just a beautiful set of books in my opinion. I, I, they're comfort reads for me. Um, I like Kristen Higgins. Uh, just One of the Guys is my absolute favourite of her books and, again, it's another comfort read. Uh, I love Rachel Gibson's C. James Score. I just, there are scenes in that book that I just think are just perfect. Um Gosh, there's so many. Uh, I love Anne Gracie. I love Anna Campbell. Um, I love reading my friend Joan Kilby's super romances. She's a very, um, she writes such fantastically real heroes who are have got these really realistic flaws, but they're uh, which even make makes them even more heroic. I think because you know they are human. They're so human. I love. Um, oh, I've been reading a little bit of. Um, I read fantasy fiction, so I love Robin Hobb, um, George R. R. Martin, and, yeah, things like that. I read a little bit of everything, but I mostly read romance. I'm um, heavily into Nalini Singh and the paranormals at the moment. I actually just read my first side Changelings um, not so long ago, actually. Very slow to catch on to that one, and I do understand the addictive cracktastic power of them now. I think I gobbled up five or six of them all at once, and uh, but I haven't embarked on the angels yet. They're a great read too. I'm, I'm desperate for September for the next one of those. <laughs> but anyway, you know, it keeps us on the edge of our seats. That's the end of the questions and the digging into your life and your processes. So for more information about Sarah and to read about her upcoming books or to catch up on her blog, head on over to her website, www.sarahmaybury.com. Sarah, thanks for your time. I hope you've enjoyed sharing a little bit of yourself with us tonight. And, uh, you know, you've got your current fans. And after tonight, I'm sure you'll pick up a few more fans from ARRA. Thank you so much for having me and for your, your generosity and time. It's been lovely. It's always lovely to talk about writing and to even have people that are interested in talking about my books. It's, uh, it's lovely. Thank you. Well, goodbye, everyone. I look forward to welcoming you to my interview with the lovely Anne Gracie in the very near future. Good night. Mm -hmm.